Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's briefing. What if the water can't be stopped? Tribal resilience plans in an age of sea level rise. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the executive director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. We thought this was a very appropriate topic, given especially that it is Earth Day week, and that we had the opportunity to have people in town this week also uh, who are telling their story, talking to people in different communities in Philadelphia and New York as well, to really look at some of the issues that are happening with regard to indigenous people and to particularly tell the story of a, a particular tribe in Louisiana. Now, this whole thing is part of obviously a much larger picture that we are seeing here in the United States and certainly globally. And as we said, this is the second in a ser uh, briefing series that we have held with regard to recommendations coming out of the White House Task Force uh, on Climate Resilience and Adaptation from perspectives of state, local, and tribal nations. So. Today we are going to take a particular look at what this means for tribal nations and in terms of looking particularly at the situation confronting uh, a very um, uh, charismatic and important leader and great connector among uh, tribal nations in terms of Chief Albert Nakin, who is unfortunately not able to be here, but we will see him in the film clip that we are soon to see, his, there is uh, illness in his family, so he was not able to join us today. But he is the chief of the uh, band of Isle de Jean Charles, of, uh, of the Biloxi Chittimacha Choctaw Nation, and is, of course, in Louisiana, where they are watching in terms of their isle, their island in terms of the bayou, literally disappearing before their eyes after having been there for generations and generations. But what they are doing is another very, very interesting story. So we are first going to start to hear this story um, by taking a look at a film that has been made, and we're going to just see a little clip of that. And for that, I'd like to just introduce the filmmaker, Rebecca Ferris, to introduce this. Thank you so much for having us here. I um, really appreciate the EESI um, for organizing this. Uh, so the film is called Can't Stop the Water, and uh, my husband and I made it together while we were living in Louisiana and deeply concerned about coastal erosion and sea level rise um, for many, many reasons. We should all be concerned because of just the environmental impacts on wildlife and habitat and the economic uh, risks it poses to the port, the Mississippi River port, and the economic impacts it will have on that, but also, most importantly, the human impacts. Um, so this film is about a community that's dealing, they're really on the front lines of this coastal erosion and sea level rise. Um, they are planning on relocating because they have no choice. Um, so this is just a five minute clip that will show you, introduce you to the chief of the tribe. You'll also get a sense of a little bit of the family life that um, is becoming more and more difficult to sustain on the island and then also the uh, plan for, you know, solution to uh, really preserving the community and keeping them together. So I will let the, the clips speak for themselves and then the experts take over. Thank you. As a kid, the island basically at that time we probably had land about five miles across, and uh, on the north end, going to the south end, we probably were looking at about seven miles of, uh, of land. 
Today, we have uh, probably a quarter mile wide, I guess, counting the whole thing. I mean, then after that, it comes out to be open water. It's uh, totally, totally different. They had to remove the lack of 1830. There was going to chase us all to Oklahoma. And during the removal act, we came down here to, to get away from the Trail of Tears. Basically, that's when we moved to, to the island. But today, our land is almost gone. I use a calculator. Yeah. Do that with your eye again. Close it. Oh. The kids have to wake up so early to go to school because of travel time. Uh, you wearing your jacket or what, baby? Oh. Oh, come on down in the uh, elevator. The island children does have transportation for school, but since the uh, hurricane of uh, Gustav and Ike, uh, the road has been too damaged for the bus to come down because it's too dangerous. The road is too narrow. And so now what the children have to do to go to school, they have to be shuttled uh, in the morning and in the afternoon where they got a pickup spot at. And that's as far as the bus is gonna go. We've been stuck now with a one lane road that connects the island to the mainland to come in and to come out. The road is actually a barrier and a road at the same time, but the road was never constructed to be a levee. If uh, it wasn't for this road breaking the salt water coming in and out every day with the tide, it would erode this 5,000 acres right here in a matter of a couple of years. And what we're gonna try this time is we're putting this stone, the water can go in and out of it placing this fabric. It also helps with erosion. Plus, we're going to elevate the road about another foot and uh, six inches of asphalt and the revetment, and, and hopefully that'll hold off a while. I do think them ra raising up the road, it is a big step, and I do, do I think once it's fixed that everything will be OK? No, not at all. I'm thankful for what they are doing, but a foot up, whenever that water comes up, it's up almost three feet. What a foot's gonna do? Right now, everybody from the island is going into different communities because they have to move off because of hurricanes. The community needs a place to go to put them back together. So this property here could redevelop, not just as a, as a home for the island people, we could redevelop our culture, which is dying. Call it the Isle Jean Charles, new reservation. As of yet, I haven't, I haven't won too many battles, but I brought quite a few out to, to the field. So we all know how, how that is. For me, it stands for the freedom and the tribe, but uh, we're gonna do it together as a community. And eventually the war's gonna be won. Rebecca, thank you. And I would love to see the rest of the film. Um, that gives us a little bit of a glimpse into the story, the important issues that people are confronting, and to help lead us through this discussion this afternoon to tell the story, some of the impacts, and some of the solutions that are being talked about uh, by a tribal nation that is asking a lot of questions, is being very resilient and indeed a model, I think, for, for all of us. So to start us off, 
I want to uh, introduce Dr. Julie Maldonado, uh, who will uh, who will basically lead us through this discussion and introduce uh, Bob Goff and, and JR as we talk about these issues. Uh, Julie uh, did her doctoral research from uh, her experience, based upon her experiences of environmental change and displacement in tribal communities in coastal Louisiana. So she's done a lot of uh, consulting for the UN Development Program and the World Bank looking at post-disaster needs assessments. And she also worked for the National Climate Assessment for four years and was a lead author on the third National Climate Assessment's Indigenous Peoples, Land and Resources chapter and also co-organized co Rising Voices 2, which is adaptation to climate change and variability, bringing together science and indigenous ways of knowing to create positive solutions, which is what we're really going to hear about in terms of this story today. Julie? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Carol, and to ESI for having us, and to all of you for taking the time to come today. Um, I want to, uh, yes, I was greatly honored to uh, live uh, um, with folks, uh, Neil Dijon Charles, and have worked with them for several years now. And um, with us today, um, unfortunately, as Carol said, Chief Albert really wanted to be here with us. Um, he does have an illness in the family, and um, so he needed to be um, at home with his family right now, but he is uh, thinking of all of us. Um, I want to introduce you to J.R. Nakan, who is a tribal member of Ile de Jean Charles, and he is gracious enough to uh, step up to the plate um, in Chief Albert's absence, and so we're lucky to have him here with us. And also Bob Goff with the Inner Tribal Council on Utility Policy. Uh, Bob is also a tribal attorney, um, and he has worked very closely with Ile de Jean Charles the last couple of years through the Indigenous Peoples Climate Change Working Group, um, as well as specifically what you'll hear about today, the relocation plan and strategies for renewable, energy-driven, sustainable community um, in their community-led relocation actions. Um, and so to start us off, I'm going to ask um, JR to introduce himself a bit, tell you about his story of growing up on the aisle and um, what's now happening with the community. So, Jack. Thank you, Julie. Thank you all for coming. Uh, This is tough. Uh, growing up down there, it was, uh, it's changed a lot. I'm 52 years old and it's changed so much. Uh, where there was land, you know, everything, we were all a community. And when I was a kid, I remember my dad telling me when they used to add on to homes. I mean, it's not like you could drive to, it's not like you could drive today. Uh, they go get lumber. They'd all gather together, and they'd go. If somebody needed an addition on a house or build a new house, they'd all get together. The whole community would get together, and they'd build that person's house. And it's it's amazing the the stories that you hear. It'd be nice if they would put it on paper, uh, but it's not. It's passed on to the kids. The kids pass it back on to their kids, and that's what I'm here. And, uh, but the island is, island people are a tight knit group of people, but the erosion has chased a bunch of people out. The coast of the erosion has chased a lot of people out. Storms, uh, when the road was damaged last time, as you seen in the picture, they said it was not going to fix the road again. Uh, this was the last time that they was going to repair that road. And that's the only road in, it's the only road out. And we still have families living down there. Uh, and the goal here is to relocate everyone as a tribe, as a group, back as a community. And the people that moved, we want to get them back into the same community to live like on a reservation like we grew up with. And... Uh, it's going to be a tough fight for that. There's a lot of people against us. And uh, 
But the chief is going to fight. He's wish you could have seen some rest of that video because you would have known he's he's dedicated to this, and we all are. We're all dedicated to this, and the relocation is is needed because. Say this year, there's a storm, the road's knocked out, they're not going to fix it. People are going to take a boat to get to their homes. And kids won't, kids won't be able to go to school or they'll have to relocate, they'll have to move. So what the Chief's trying to do is get a bunch of agencies together, groups of people, and which he has, he's spoken to many groups of people. And uh, our goal is to relocate everyone as a community back in one tight group is the goal here. And what else? You've relocated yourself? Yes. I've relocated. I moved. I had to. Because I was missing work. Todd if Todd comes up, road floods, I had to turn around. Water was too high, you couldn't pass your vehicle over the over the highway. And picture yourself on a two lane highway with nothing on the side to guide you, to show you where to go. I mean, it was so, I had to relocate, I moved, so I could keep on working. Uh, I've got two kids, and they, one of them lives close to me, which I didn't move that far away, because, I mean, it's, I was born and raised down there, I was moved from there, I was 19 years old, and I moved. And I miss it. I miss it a lot. So I think I'm gonna pass it on to Bob. My name is Bob Goff. I'm the secretary of the Intertribal Council on Utility Policy, Intertribal Coup. Um, we're one of the co-chairs of the first Native Peoples, Native Homelands Climate Workshop back in the 90s through USGCRP, and we've been involved in climate issues for some time. I'd like to ask, how many people here are here with a connection to climate and adaptation? Just any show hands. Okay. How many people here with some connection to the bayou in Louisiana? Okay, a couple of you. All right. How many people here are under age 20? Thank you. You represent our youth. Half of our populations are under 20 years old in Indian country today. All the rest of you are elders. You're on the elder side of the line. Welcome. So there's a lot of that we have to do to help that coming generation because they're the ones going to be bearing the brunt of what, what, what this is all about. I'm just going to take a couple of moments here to put into a context, and then we can get a conversation going, the context of what's going on here in the bayou in Louisiana. Worldwide, indigenous peoples are the first and worst hit with the impacts of climate change because subsistence culture is based on intact habitats, and climate change is disrupting habitats. Now, I, I realize it's a risk coming all the way to Congress and mentioning that C word. So usually when we talk about it, we talk about weather extremes because adaptation to weather extremes is basically the same kinds of things you've got to do. It's not the mitigation, but it's how you're going to cope with it, how we're going to live with it. And for all of my world travels and U.S. travels, I have not met one weather denier. I don't see any here. You're all experts. You've all got stories. You've seen records. You've been engaged in this. That gets the conversation past denial and into what are we going to do about it. Now, there's not a lot of communities as communities looking to see what we can do about it. We work with folks in the Pacific. Those islands are getting inundated with salt water from underneath, ruining vegetation, lapping into the, into the land areas on the, on the islands. We're seeing in Alaska, um, the Corps of Engineers estimates over a hundred villages are going to need to relocate due to stormwater surging, um, permafrost melting, erosion along the rivers and sea levels, sea, sea coasts, at the tune of a hundred 
one and a half million dollars per household was the EIS estimate for relocating villages, whole villages. A tremendously expensive undertaking. Some communities up there have been working on this 15, 20 years. In the bayou, this community has been working on it for at least 15 years. And they are likely to be the first in the lower 48, in the mainland, in the lower 48, as a community to take this problem as a, as a nation, as a group, and look to relocate it. JR just said he's personally had to relocate. Most of the evacuations that come with hurricanes and storm surges, it's individuals go someplace as refugees and not, they don't always come back. But it's not consciously, deliberately moving as a community. And that's what this community, this tribe is doing. And they're not new to it. They moved as a community, as a tribe in the 1830s from Florida, from the Seminole area, the, the Everglades, moved along the Trail of Tears and didn't want any part as a, as a marine-based, um, fishing-based culture. You really don't want to be in Oklahoma for that kind of, that kind of uh, culture. So they took a turn consciously as a group, found themselves someplace on the island back right after Lewis and Clark had come through and the Louisiana Purchase had set that up and have been there for over the last 200 years. And now, once again, without federal recognition as an American Indian tribe, they're state recognized, but they have been behaving as a community and as a tribe for over 200 years, and now they're called upon again to do that. And in so doing, they're trying to get the best of 21st century expertise, advice, looking at how do you rebuild or maintain a marine economy when you move north, maybe north of Highway 10 in Louisiana. How do you keep that orientation going? I mean, these folks have been hit. We're, we're meeting today on the fifth anniversary of, of BP Deep Horizon spill. We're not here today to look back. We're here today to look 100 years forward, seven generations forward, to see how this community can continue to being viable and being maintaining their culture and maintaining a life way and values for their young people. So we're looking at what are the renewable energy opportunities maybe for building new housing development, very energy efficient homes. What kind of work can we do around that? We've talked about um, jobs on the mainland that are associated with the devastation that more and frequent and more intense storms are likely to bring. What if this community got engaged in you know, tree limb removal after the storm and landfilled all of that back out on the islands, back out in the bayous, start really being very proactive in an environmental kind of way as well? They are facing issues when the sea level rises or the land falls, as a, another popular notion has it, all the extraction of oil and gas from that gulf has caused the land to sink while at the same time the sea level is rising. So they're getting hit with both ends of that very dramatic story and trying to make the best of it. They're looking at maybe if you could collect derelict hulls and use them as incubators for marine life to give those small critters an extra month, a couple of weeks, extra time to grow, get strong, deal with predation, and repopulate, revegetate, re rejuvenize those waters. Looking at technology of putting mushroom, uh, oyster mushrooms in to detoxify the, the petroleum pollution that they're dealing with. Finding ways of keeping that habitat being good to it, the same way that habitat's been good to them for the last 200 years. So all of this is what's in play, and I just wanted to put that out there so that you can see this in that larger indigenous picture of how communities are looking to address that. We don't see that a lot throughout the rest of the country, but these guys are not going to be climate refugees. These folks are, are, are scouts, they're indigenous scouts for a new way in the 21st century to be able to thrive with culture and values and dignity intact.
Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for that. And yeah, you know, Bob mentioned, you know, it's really a conglomeration of factors that's happening here. Um, you know, we do acknowledge it's the fifth anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon disaster, but really the disaster we're talking about here is the continuous immense amount of land loss that is occurring in Louisiana. Um, land that was supposed to be lost 20 years from now was lost 10 years ago. You know, U.S. Geological Survey, if you look at a map, it's already outdated by the time they drew it. Um, you cannot keep up with it. And so this is happening to many communities across uh, coastal Louisiana, across the Gulf, as well as other parts of the country. Um, Chief Albert's community, as Bob said, being one of the few that has really taken a proactive approach um, and coming up with their own solutions. Um, they've been doing so for 15 years. Um, they've been cut out of... Um, of hurricane protection systems and so have really looked at their own initiatives and what they can do together as a community, as a tribe, and make sure that they do it with dignity and they do it to maintain their cultural sovereignty and heritage as they move forward. And so just to highlight a few things, as Chief Albert and the Tribal Council and other members of the tribe um, has been working over the last two decades, um, they've been working at this from really the local up to the international level. They've met, as you can see, with um, the United Nations at the United Nations Indigenous Forum, spoke with the United Nations Rapporteur for Human Rights. Um, they've talked with, you know, across the agencies, the EPA, to NOAA, um, working at the local level with the parish equivalent to a county um, level and across um, many NGOs and a lot of uh, universities as well. Um, they've also uh, created a lot of partnerships and formed a lot of viable supporters along the way. Um, and by doing this and by forming these various partnerships um, with academic institutions, with agencies, what they've done um, also is partnering together with these communities to write a number of grant proposals um, to really to put together you know, a relocation plan. That's a big, broad spectrum. You have a lot of components there because it, right, it's not just about building houses and moving people into them. This is about bringing an entire community back together to maintain social networks, to reinvigorate the culture, and how do you do that with, with dignity in place and maintaining their rights? And so they've pieced together many different components and looked at it, you know, at a microcosm scope, what is it that we need to do to make sure all these pieces come together? So as you can see, um, they're looking at many different angles, reaching out across the table to a lot of different um, agencies, supporters, advocates, um, working with them to look at the different components that are necessary to move forward. Um, and in doing this, they've also been heavily engaged. Um, Chief Albert's tribe is one of the ones who's really been a connector to where we are today in this conversation. Um, they were part of an initiative that put forward a recommendation to, as uh, Carol mentioned, the state local tribal leaders task force on, on climate preparedness and resilience. Because of Chief Albert's words, and what his community is doing, a recommendation went to the task force talking directly about climate migration. Um, and there are conversations going on last week on the Hill, this week, and I believe next week as well, directly related to these recommendations. Um, this was also put forward in the bicameral task force report in 2013. Um, so this is co happening across the board, and Chief Albert and his tribe has been really one of the main voices coming through that. So you often, you know, I know a lot of folks in this room see those reports, see the outcomes. Um, these are the folks and the voices behind why it's gotten to that point. Um, so just a little bit of a broader scope as to what they've been doing to connect this for the rest of the country as well and for all the communities that are facing these issues. Um, but obviously there's a lot that needs to be done but between today and when eventually we do have um, a legislative action. So really what Chief Albert's community is looking at doing is being an exemplar model, a teaching community that says, we're ready to do this now. We have a plan in place, reaching across for support, for partnerships. Let us engage together so we can also learn how this process works, right? This is something, relocation, if you decide when that water comes, it's too late to make that decision. That water's on you, as JR mentioned. 
And so one of the key things like Chief Albert is doing and some other communities across the country is saying we need that plan in place and we need to act now because once that water comes, it's too late, we're scattered, and our culture's been lost. And to really maintain that viability, so he's looking for folks to partner with them really at this moment to say what can we do now, today, to work with us, support us in this effort, but not just for the community, for agencies, for their partners to say how can we learn about these different processes because this is a very long process to make happen. And so looking at what, who you work with, what are your components, how do you feed into this process and what could be learned for other communities facing this, these issues so we can do it in an efficient, respectful manner. Um, and if JR wants to speak at all to some of um, really, you know, the, what the community um, urgency right now. Um, the tribe has about 650 members total, um, but, and actually I'll give a plug for the film. It talks, if you see the whole film, it talks uh, more about the specific populations. But, for example, on the island, um, there was about, two, up to two, in 2002, there was about 325 people, about 78 homes. Um, 2002, you had Hurricane Lily. 2005, you have um, Katrina. Rita, 2008, you have Gustav Ike, then you have Lee, then you have Isaac. Today there's 20, about 25 homes. Um, so even just in the last 10 years, you've lost two thirds of the people um, that were there as recent as 2002. What Bob said earlier, I'm sorry, what Bob said earlier about the community, we're trying to keep the community together. It's our main goal is we want to keep our tribe in one place, one area, to get it back together. And uh, the road's going to erode. We, we know that for a fact, that it's going to go. It's just a matter of time when it's going to happen. And the people that's there now, they don't want to leave. They don't want to. They don't want to go, but they know they'll have to go one day. So what the chief is trying to do is get everyone back together as a community like it used to be. That's his goal. And whatever help we could get, whatever agency we could get in contact with to, for the help to, help, to have this relocation happen, I know the chief would be very elated. Uh, I don't know what else. Um, so I think we have some time. To, um, Bob, did you have any last comments? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, but by way of background, I'm Irish on my dad's side and Lenape on my mom's side. And uh, they're the people who lived in lower Manhattan, New Jersey, Delaware, the Delaware tribe. Um, we left from New Jersey as a tribe after the French and Indian War, because we were the allies with the French. A lot of the folks ended up down in Cherokee in Oklahoma, where these guys were headed. Um, our folks went up to Canada, and individuals came back. My family members as individuals came back, not as a tribe. So we had tribal members back in our homeland where we fished, hunted, gathered, crabbed, clammed, all of that stuff. I grew up doing that until the 60s when the pollution that came from oil refining in Jersey polluted the waters. You couldn't do it. But I tell you that because after 200 years, people could go back to a homeland that was still there. We're now working with a community. Their homeland is disappearing underneath their feet. They've got no place for that last 200 years to go back to if the rise of sea level continues the way it, we're seeing it happen. So it's, a, it's an extraordinary spiritual blow as well as historical and economic and political and all of those kinds of things, social. So I just wanted to put that out there, that, that 
we're, 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 we're with people who are seeing things that most of us have never had to even imagine. And it's happening right now. It's happening right now here in the lower 48. So um, I, I sort of want to underscore all the good work that's been done, not only by Albert, but Chief Albert and, and the, the various groups working with the administration through the uh, climate task force work that the uh, state and local and tribal governments were involved in. Um, this is the opportunity for us to really look not as the canary in the mine, but again as the as the navigators for the 21st century for community. So, just wanted to put that on the table. Um, I think with that, uh, I think we'll open it up for any questions or comments that folks have. So, uh, Mike McCracken from the Climate Institute. Is, is there any coordination or effort by the state to try and do something south of New Orleans? I mean, presumably they're going to try not to withdraw from New Orleans and move it, but to protect it. And the protection has always been the delta and the mangroves to the south of New Orleans to protect it from the storm surge. And the, and the high winds. And so if the people south of New Orleans are having to retreat and relocate and move, what does that mean for New Orleans? And what are they, what, if anything, are they doing to, to sort of think about preserving some of that, well, what used to be called the shock absorber for storms south of New Orleans? So um, the... The Louisiana's Coastal Protection Restoration Authority, um, they do have a, mas a master plan, a coastal master plan um, looking ahead to 2050. And if you look at that coastal master plan, basically that is the outline for all of the restoration efforts that will be taking place in the state, both um, proposed and being ongoing right now. Um, if you look at the maps of that plan, it shows that by 2050, the aisle will be completely gone if there's no restoration activities south of it. Um, and at the current rate of land loss, coastal Louisiana is, lo is, losing great, is losing greater amount of land at a rate faster than anywhere else in the world um, in combination of rising sea levels along with the subsidence. So you have a greatest rate of relative sea level rise worldwide. One and a half football fields an hour is disappearing. So one can, yeah, as we saw in the maps here, you can see even that land loss right from 1940 until today. Um, and so one of the issues, you can imagine then that this is going to happen much sooner than 2050. And if you look at that map, there is a distinct red line that shows you where the restoration efforts are going to save and what's not going to be saved. Ile de Jean Charles is south of that line. It's one of the only places south of that line. It was originally north of that. It was originally part of that. Um, it was deemed not worth saving. And so it's now south of that line. So there are restoration activities going on. Um, however, when those decisions were made, they were, they, the CPRA spoke with oil and gas. They spoke with big aquaculture industry. That's, they spoke with big navigation. They did not consult communities. There were public hearings held after the master plan was drafted. Um, so yes, there is enormous amount of activity going on. Um, that is not going to help communities like Ile de Jean Charles. Um, so that is one, yeah. So there is some things going on south of there, um, but Ile de Jean Charles is not included in that plan. So Julie or Bob or JR, so because that has been specifically excluded from these restoration plans, what does this state say then in terms of what's, what's the status as far as looking for land relocation possibilities? What's, what's happening on that front? Well, the chief has been looking in, the chief has been looking into Proper, different properties, and uh, he's got a plan. He's got a plan. He's just 
these are funding to go along with the plan. Uh, yeah, he's got a master plan to relocate the group, put them all together, uh, bring houses in, uh, do solar panels and mm -hmm. all that energy uh, efficiency. Uh, he wants to do all the houses the same way, uh, but he does have a plan in place. He just needs to help to get it going. Uh, yeah, and just to um, and add to that, one issue is there. There is there are options for individual buyouts and relocation, but not. For but that's what's been happening, right? People, you know, like Jr. said, you other family members have had to relocate individually. What Chief Albert and Neil to John Charles is about is community, right? right. So there is an individual option, and what that does is further. T Tear, tear the community apart, apart. Right. and so this is about bringing keeping that community together and bringing back the people who have already been forced to relocate bringing them back into that cohesive unit to really maintain their cultural sovereignty as they move forward well i was just curious about the interaction in terms of the state with response to this whole plan and everything because as bob was also saying as you look at alaska native villages as well that there are whole communities that are going to need to relocate and and in terms of looking at this as an exemplar or an ex how hopefully this what the plans are could be replicated other places in terms of communities being able to together move and to do it all as one i was just curious then in terms of if you could talk a little bit about interaction among some of these other groups and whether people are really banding together. Um, actually, I'm glad you raised that because one of the real significant partnerships that has occurred is with um, Chief Albert and communities in Alaska um, with folks like the leaders of New Talk in Alaska and Kivalina, Alaska. Um, they've really formed strong alliances and partnerships and working together to uncover lessons learned. Um, these communities have been going through it for a generation themselves and they've come across a lot of obstacles and hiccups along the way and so now what they're looking at is what are the opportunities that we have. Um, obviously you're working within different local contexts with different local and state governments um, but there's a greater issue and a lot of similarities to be shared. Um, and uh, Ilda Jean Charles um, has worked um, quite closely with local municipality level um, working on some small projects um, and so working within um, with their local government um, however unfortunately it seemed too little too late and so you know the number one choice for communities is to stay but in this case they've deemed that really you know the institute adaptation is no longer viable um, and so to keep that community together that the relocation um, is the best path forward and based upon what you all said, time is not our friend here. Carol, uh, excellent question. And again, thank you for allowing this forum to happen here, especially in the capital, especially where the buzzword of resilience and resilient communities and there's funding opportunities and all that. We know scientifically communities, people as a community can be far more resilient than individuals as individual persons. You need those bonds, you need that strong intertie and this, this coming together. This is an example. And what you folks here in our nation's lawmaking center need to do is put a filter in your mind, in your head as you're working, and see how do the laws we have make resilience, make sustainability illegal. We need to legalize sustainability. We need to legalize resilience. Our rules, our laws are not really set to do that. We have all sorts of rights for government and all sorts of rights for individuals. Indigenous peoples understand they not only have unalienable rights, but they have unalienable responsibilities. And that's to their self, their family, their kinship, and to their place to their planet. 
So here's an opportunity where, as you're looking over legislation and whatnot, start thinking, does this help communities rather than just provide special opportunities for special individuals? Someone pointed out to us yesterday, we did a little session the other side of town. They said, you know, that, that, you know the Occupy and the 1% and all the consciousness changing. When you look at the planet, human beings, a species, we're the 1% on the planet. And we've got the swing vote on, as to how this is going to turn out for us. So let's not make it more difficult with old mindsets. Let's see if we can't bring a new mindset to the changes and to the opportunities we need to build and, and, and help nourish our communities become resilient. Legalize sustainability. Legalize resilience. Don't make it obstacles. Find ways through those, those, those waters and find ways that we can, we can actually bring some very positive. Because, again, I grew up in New Jersey. We are now in Union Beach building houses that look just like the ones on the bayou. They're up on stilts. People had to do that because no dunes, that water from Sandy came in and wiped out good chunks of those communities along the seacoast. It's happened in the wealthiest part of our nation. It's happening in the poorest parts of our nation. We're all going to be affected. My dear friend Winona LaDuc says, doesn't matter what boat you came over on, we're all in the same boat now. So uh, appreciate that. I've been. I go fishing. You know, but they do. The people get together and put it all back. They don't move. They stay there. The kids go to school on the back of a charter boat. The people go to store on the charter boat. The charter boat captains don't make money. And in a little while, everything gets back together again, and it's the same as before. Now, they need the federal government to put the dunes back, and they need the state to rebuild the bridges, but in a little while, the whole community is back the way it was before, and they don't have to move. Now, that's just a comment that I'm making. Hello. Um, my name is Denise Pollock, and I am a member of the village of Shishmaraf in Alaska. And um, I just want to thank you all for coming today and presenting. Um, I really appreciate your stories, um, especially because I understand in many ways what, um, what this tribe in Louisiana is going through. Um, and I'm also very appreciative that you brought up... Um, what's going on in Alaska, because a lot of Alaska Native villages are facing this reality. Um, so I, so Shishmaraf is an island in the Bering Straits region, and um, it's predicted to be gone within like the next 10 to 15 years. Um, and the thing you need to understand about Shishmaraf is that within my community, more than half of the population relies on subsistence activities for their livelihood. And so the idea of relocating to a city, which is what a lot of agencies would love for us to do because it's the least expensive, um, would crumble our culture. It would um, significantly change our identity. Um, and another, another thing that people need to understand about the realities in Alaska Native villages is that our community voted to, um, to stay dry, which means we don't allow alcohol in our village. And so you need to understand the sociocultural impacts of relocation. Um, my nieces and nephews, they live in our village. They live in a place where 
our culture is sacred. And if we move or we re relocate individually into cities, it completely changes who, who we are as a people. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to bring in my perspective on what's going on in Alaska. Um, and I really appreciate um, Bob bringing up the fact that we need to empower communities, not individuals. We need to empower communities because all of our strength is in our communities. Thank you. Miigwech. Any other questions or comments? Go ahead, Mike. Well, let me ask one more. What is happening to the Cajun community south of New Orleans and in the Delta area? What is happening to the Cajun community as well? I mean, they're another community that of people in a region. Are they experiencing a similar situation? Um, yeah, I mean, there's many long-dwelling communities in coastal Louisiana, not just indigenous um, Cajuns being one, there's the Elenos, there's a whole, you know, it's, it's really a melting pot, if you want to talk about a melting pot. Um, and so many communities who have been there for generations and generations. Um, you know, what's interesting, what happened before you had, you know, the Acadian, the Cajuns moving down, but then as, as JR talked about a bit in the history, and Bob did, um, the indigenous communities really to survive and not have to go to Oklahoma move to the most southern deemed uninhabitable parts, right? And so what you actually have now is some of the indigenous communities looking to now jump back over and moving back up north. Um, and when you talked about earlier kind of this shock zone being gone, so what was once all this land south, um, the communities like Yilda John Charles have now become that shock zone. And so it isn't just the tribal communities, but they are some of the ones that are the most um, far south because when you look at some of the socio-historical processes of what um, pushed them there. But I think, I'm guessing what you're looking at some of the communities directly south of New Orleans, places like Venice, Boris, um, um, you know, that are other fishing communities and are, you know, in places like Grand Isle that, and they're also, you know, needing to have these conversations and facing some similar issues. Um, but because of the very unique environment of Ville de Jean Charles, where it's really, sur it was surrounded by so much marshland and it's had so much infrastructure um, from the oil and gas companies just be cut right through it. Um, the intensity of the land loss around Ville de Jean Charles is so extreme and it is a different intensity even than some other parts of coastal Louisiana but it is happening across all of southeast coastal Louisiana so you go directly south of New Orleans communities there are facing some of the very same issues um, and that's why what Ilda Jean Charles is proposing um, can really be used as that exemplar model um, for what other communities are going to be facing as well it's not just about Ilda Jean Charles um, but they are one of the ones with a plan in place right now while he's composing maybe a, another thought, I wanted to just say there's a very interesting coincidence. We didn't plan this, but as I understand it, there will be hearings in two days on federal acknowledgement process. And it's one of those federal actions that the community's been involved in for, for decades. And um, I, I just find it ironic that a group that moved as a group in the 1830s is still moving as a group, but there's somehow we don't recognize them as having been a group for that entire period of time. Um, we, we, we need to be able to look at that and find ways to aid all of the communities with whatever opportunities we have, and either this is a legislatively or administratively and the like. So just a little piece of education, not lobbying. And Bob, do you want to explain why the federal acknowledgement then, should that not open up 
other avenues of support in terms of the um, master plan that Chief Albert has been developing? I would presume that that would be right. Important. If you're a federally recognized tribe with a relation, ongoing relationship with the federal government, you can then start talking about, well, how about a land swap? Would you like our island or what's left of it for a little bit of uh, solid land that you've got in a national park somewhere or some other federal agency that's holding on to it? The opportunities for even to get surplus property become a viable alternative for building a new economy for a tribal community. They're, they're, they're not necessarily looking at the next casino in, in, on the water. Uh, they're looking for a viable homeland for the next seven generations. So uh, just, just bear that in mind if that's something that crosses your desk. Thank you. Um, you know, but one thing, I mean, so it does open up opportunities, but until that recognition comes, they can still approach us as a community, mm -hmm. right? And so many of the grants that were shown earlier, um, while they may not qualify as a federally recognized tribe, they qualify as a community, mm -hmm. um, like any other community in the U.S. can do. And so they can approach this as doing this and applying for things as a community. Um, so it's, that's one big approach that they've been taking. And also, um, in relation to what Bob said a bit, it's also about part of the plan is also working to restore what is left of the island, because this is, you know, as JR talked about, this is ancestral land. Um, this is their homeland. It's been their homeland where they were forced to, but it's become their new homeland. Right. And so it's also not just, if it, just because it becomes uninhabitable does not mean it's a place to just go away entirely. And so it's also, they are taking actions to try to restore what is left, um, so it still ma it maintains a place that people could have something to go back to, at least for the foreseeable near future, um, and do what they can to restore it, especially while people are still living there. Because um, while you know many have relocated, there are still an, some families who are still living there today with a number of children, as we saw in the um, right. film clip. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Alan uh, and I'm going to bring up something uh, involving what I said before. The people that I'm talking about in North Carolina, they're different than uh, the Indians. The Indians were indigenous. The North Carolinian people, they were pirates. That's, how, that's where North Carolina, the coastal people came from as pirates. And what they did was they went out and <laughs> trapped boats and captured the boats and <laughs> stole all the stuff off the boats. And those are the people that make up, you know, the, the fishermen now. They're tough people, the ones that are left. And so when the storm hits, first of all, there's a lot more money down there because there's a lot of resources. And so those people, they, they don't move. They build. And I'm not saying it's any different than your people, but that's the way it is. That's what I just bring that up. Piracy is an economic development strategy. I kind of kind of like that. <laughs> It worked for a long time, right? There's a name of a family down there, the pirates now. Not now. Then, now they have the wives and they're working for us. They're still pirates. And I think, as you mentioned, that there is a lot of state and federal help that has gone into that. As, so, um, okay, there was a question or comment over here. Hi, uh, my name is Sean Nevins. I'm a journalist. And uh, this one's for Bob. You, you proposed a question to us, and you said, um, how do laws make sustainability illegal? And I think you have something specific in mind, and I wonder if you could just let us know what you were thinking specifically. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, m most of it are local laws, um, building codes and all sorts of things. But FEMA, for, as an example, as an agency example, has some very, you know, um, well-crafted and understood regulation about rebuilding in flood zones and things like that. And we've got to be mindful of those issues. But at the same time, um, aid that would come to a community that's already had 
their properties devalued and devastated, and then you get a fraction of what it's worth if you're able to trade it out in some form or other, really handicap a community trying to relocate and doing something like that. Um, we've run into it with, um, we're looking at uh, straw bale buildings in the Great Plains, and um, a lot of uh, insurance companies aren't quite sure how you handle that. Uh, they don't have codes, a lot of building codes for things like that. And you talk about it as simply insulation and you're able to move forward. But we, we find a lot of what we've done in the past, we've reified into law and code. And then it gets in the way of innovation towards the future. So there, I mean, I'd be happy to talk to you offline on other kinds of examples. But uh, wastewater, how do we, what we handle with wastewater, every time you flush, you pollute and make a whole lot of fresh water, black water, with every flush. And then you have to treat all of that black water at a very large expense, versus if you could find ways of just focusing that into gray and, and, and moving that separately. It's going to cost us in our infrastructure and in our systems because we've designed it in a period of, of, of abundance. We've designed it in a period of, of, of great um, volumes of water, especially in the Great Plains. We are now moving historically into what's likely to be maybe up to a century of drought, and that's under natural variation. We, we don't even talk about climate change. We look at the, the drought in the West. We see these century and a half cycles, wet with little dry spots, little droughts, then long dry periods with little wet spots. The entire settlement of the Great Plains, where their water comes from, Mississippi and over to the Missouri, that water comes from those headwaters. That water for the last century and a half has been relatively abundant, wet. But we're, we know the last 2,000 years, you go back, we've had century and a half of drought. We've lived the last century and a half, all of the Euro-American settlement of the Northern Great Plains happened during the wet period. That's what we conceive of as normal. We will get back to normal. We, le we legislate around that. We build codes around that understanding of normal and any five six generation rancher will tell you yeah, it's tough we get droughts but we come back to normal we're heading to the other half of the big normal and we're not ready for that we're not ready for that at all and california is the is the canary in the mine on that question for water so we're we're seeing this all over the country it's not just in louisiana but you look 7,000 rivers in the heartland of this country end up going through New Orleans and not depositing any land in the delta, no soil in the delta. That's going right on out. So we've really got to be looking and thinking about the practices we've been engaged in and how we might adjust our sites for this coming century. Hi, thank you all for your great presentations. I was just wondering, it's, I had an understanding that some of the oil and gas operations in the marshlands outside of the Isle de Jean Charles were part of what caused rising seas to really deteriorate and erode the land of the island. And I was wondering if there has been any attempt to seek reparations from these oil and gas companies for the land loss that was they in part maybe contributed to. Um, so in a in a little bit broader sense for coastal Louisiana, there, um, I don't know if you've seen it, for East New Orleans Parish initiated um, a suit of the levy board against 97 oil and gas companies that um, has essentially been deemed, it's, it's stuck in the court system now, um, but essentially um, Governor Jindal and others have declared that you cannot sue an oil gas company in the state of Louisiana. Um, and so communities like Ile de Jean Charles um, and others in other um, coastal parishes, um, it's, it's really caught up in litigation and hard to say what will come of it. Um, but, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Great. Um, 
I, uh, I wanted to ask just one final one, although you may have kind of answered it in certain ways, was in terms of telling your story in different venues, what you are in the process of doing, what are the things that you want, that if you're wildly successful, what do you want people to do? What are the action points, say, for the rest of us? What, what, what do you want us to do? What do you want to leave us with in terms of what we should do? Support our effort. That's number one. And whoever you can talk to to help us out, that'd be great. Let me, let me say this. We don't want to move. And we don't have any plans on moving, but we have a plan if we have to move. But right now, people don't want to go. They, they, that's their home. I mean, they're not pirates. They're Native Americans, and they want to stay where they are. They want to keep what they have. And they work hard. They've, they're commercial fishermen is what they are. It's a commercial fishing town is what they are. So. Okay, thanks. And um, I also want to I want to point out um, I don't know if folks saw when they were coming in there is a brochure as well as a two page um, front and back plan um, the Jean Charles relocation plan and if you look at this plan you can look at some of the different components um, Nathan has them for you to pick up as well um, you'll see the different components of the vision and development of this plan um, and I know many folks here work for representatives who sit on committees who work with different agencies and each of those agencies in your committees you have a mission of what you need to accomplish in that year, in that five year period, what have you. And so you can actually look at some of these components and see that they fit in to some of the committees, to certain agencies, and you see what's slotted in where. And one of the things that about this is really because there has been so much effort, we showed in our last slide, all of the partnerships of so many academics, of agency representatives, of NGOs, of activists coming together to create this plan that, as Bob talked about some of the examples before, a lot of this is ready to go with support. And so it's looking at who you're working with, what committees they're on, what agencies they work for, and which components you could support and partner in, but also looking, this is to gain on your end as well, because this is also, as we talked about, a teaching model for what can be done for other opportunities. So this is a process that you can become involved in and learn how it works. So while supporting the community, it's also supportive to the agencies back in return to see you know, what works, what can we do more effectively, efficiently, how can we work with communities in this capacity, and how we can move forward to all the other communities that are going to be facing this issue as well. So please take the, take the message back um, to um, your committees and agencies. Um, when you leave this room. So that essentially we all have homework to look at what's appropriate in terms of different places that can all then um, help contribute to um, the plan, which can also be a model for all sorts of other communities that are having to grapple with these really um, fundamental, fundamental challenges. So I want to thank you all for coming. And I, Julie, JR, Bob, thank you so, so much for helping us lead us through this whole discussion. Um, incredible, incredible story. And I also want to say thank you very much to Rebecca. And do you want to just tell us about uh, if, if people are interested in seeing the whole film, how, how does one go about that? We are under uh, um, review to, we're being considered for a PBS broadcast, so that we'll, we'll know probably in the next couple of months. But we will have DVDs actually in about a month. It's can'tstopthewater.com for more information. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very, very much. So thank I, I just want to add just as part of that homework assignment. Um, we hope that everyone here signed in. And please, before you leave this room, come talk to us and let us know um, the different components that you think that you'd be interested in, that you could support on, and that you'd want to be part of. Um, so if you already have those in your mind, please don't run out of the room and come see us before you leave. That sounds like also think about everything through a sustainability and a resilience lens so that we ask ourselves the questions before anything, before we sort of do anything legislatively so that we 
solve problems rather than create new ones. Right? And Carol, I want to thank you for the selection of this room. I just started looking at the photographs on the wall, and they are from the Curtis era. Yes. When, when yeah. it was documenting the vanishing Americans. Well, they haven't vanished. They've gotten stronger, and they've become more resilient, and they plan on being here for a long time. Let's follow their lead. Thank you. And go ahead, Chair. I want to thank you all for coming and listening to the story. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and there's a lot more. And please do tell Chief Albert how sorry we are that he was not able to join us today, but hopefully another time. And I just hope that his family is okay. He'll definitely hear about it. All right. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.